Pseudo name here. This video is going to be a mix of tutorial and my workflow for making rainfield maps in Unity. Map making can be broken down into these parts acquiring assets, building the map, play testing, and releasing on the workshop. There will be timestamps in the description so you can skip ahead to whatever part you need. To start making maps, you're going to need the following Uni 2020.3.34 or older, the Rainfield modding tools, and a Steam version of Rainfield. I won't be teaching the basics in Unity, so I'll refer you to two videos. The first video is a tutorial that I learned Unity from. The second tutorial is a much shorter video that I skimmed through and thought was alright. Additionally, I recommend knowledge or experience with 3D modeling software. You can use any modeling software you prefer. Most Rainfield modders use Blender since it's free and also available on Steam. A Discord account and join the official Rainfield Discord server. You can ask questions about map making on the server and I post the fix for working cloth flags there as well. You can make a map without any 3D modeling knowledge through only using pre-made assets. 3D models can be found all over the internet. The easiest place to find assets is the UD Asset Store. You can find lots of free models ready for use for your map. Keep in mind that Rainfield only uses the built-in renderer. Any assets that use URP or HDRP will not render properly. You'll need to be logged into your Unity account to add the asset to your account. I recommend adding the Terrain Sample Asset Pack, I use it later in the video. Another free site is the official Discord server. Many modders share their assets like rain particle effects, aircraft carriers, and even destructible assets in the map making channel. Download the cloth flag fix that posted while you're here. If you don't use it, cloth flags won't render on your map, so players can't tell who owns the flag. I've also restored spawn icons in Unity, so you can see where bots and players spawn. Another good site is opengameart.org. All the assets here are free to use, but some may require crediting the author, so keep that in mind when you're using assets from this site. You may recognize itch.io for being a storefront for indie games, but they also host game assets uploaded by indie creators. You can filter by price if you only want to use the free assets. Just like with Open Game Art, check the permissions of the asset you're using and if you need to credit the author before using their work. The final site I'll mention is the Game Assets subreddit. All the assets people post in the subreddit are free and you can filter to only find the 3D assets. There's tons of other websites you can use, so feel free to search around and find ones you like. If you know your way around 3D modeling software, you can actually make assets yourself. Any software works as long as it can export your model as a support file type. You can even build the entire map in your modeling software and export to Unity with most of the work already done. When possible, keep the amount of separate objects as low as possible for your models. The more separate objects you have means the more things Unity must render. It's easier to render one large model than to render multiple separate ones. Don't do what I did when I was starting out, like making an entire house out of Unity cubes. The time you can spend learning how to use Blender properly rather than making a jank house. If you're deciding to use Blender for your modeling software of choice, you can import the Soldier model to use as a reference for your scale. The model can be found under Assets, RF Tools, Models, Character, Soldier.Blender. Now I'll be going over how I optimize my self-made assets. LOD, Level of Detail, is a rendering technique that changes the model at different distances. So when the player is close to an object, the engine will render the most detailed model. When far away, the model can be simplified so it's not as performance intensive. This model is a new flagpole model I've made, and you can see its tri count is 1300 triangles. For reference, the original flagpole model is under 100 triangles, so this is quite the increase. To begin making LODs, select the highest poly model, then press F2 to rename it. It must have underscore LOD0 after the name. Duplicate the model with Shift D. Now rename this model as the same name, but with underscore LOD1. Then in the Modifiers tab, add the Decimate modifier. Decimate reduces a model's face and vertex count while trying to keep the general shape the same. When you've chosen a good balance of detail and smaller face count, apply the modifier. You can repeat the process again for an even further way, LOD2. When making models for maps, keep in mind what type of colliders you want to use for the model. Unity uses colliders to calculate physics interactions between game objects. You may know these as a hitbox in other games. Primitive colliders, box, sphere, and capsule, but at least performance intensive colliders. Unity also has a mesh collider, which makes the collision follow the model exactly, but it can be pretty taxing if multiple are used. Mesh colliders have to test collision against every triangle in the mesh it's covering. Now, I'm not saying you should never use mesh colliders, but try to avoid them when possible for better performance. Mesh colliders have a convex option that makes the collider based on the outward most vertices of the mesh. 
It's easier to understand when used on this barrel. The ridges on the side are factored in when making the collider. I use primitive shapes as the collider for more complex models. Let's look at this model that I've named Wall of Pipes. Its actual shape is pretty complex since there are indentations in the model. There are even pipes I've modeled inside the graded area. The model itself is pretty blocky, so it can be simplified by using cubes. So I add cubes and align them to the edges of the Wall of Pipes model. I copy and paste the name Wall of Pipes to the cube and add box coal to organize my scene and make my life in the future simpler. I repeat the process for the rest of this model since it's all very blocky. Now how about a model more complex? I duplicate the model, rename the clone, then remove its material. I hide the original model and separate the clone's cuboid meshes from the cross sections. All the cuboid models will use box colliders, while the cross sections will use convex mesh colliders. The cross sections can't use box colliders, because the box collider will make the collider based on the outermost faces of the model. Here's a simplified drawing to explain the concept, or you can try it out to understand the problem yourself. I prefer exporting as FBX since it's what I've used since I started learning how to make maps. You can export directly into your Unity Assets folder like I did here. To make your model most compatible for maps, you must enable Apply Transform underneath the Transform section on the right side. If you want to make other types of mods aside from maps, there are specific FBX export settings you must follow. If you acquired assets from the asset store, you'll need to download and import them through Unity. Go to Window, Package Manager. Under Packages, go to My Assets, then download and import what you want to use. I've already downloaded the Skybox asset I plan to use, so I just need to wait for it to import into a Unity project. When it's done, you should scroll through the asset list and look out for any scripts that have a CS file type. Rainfield's modeling tools don't play nicely with third-party scripts, and you may get errors when trying to export your map or any other mod. For assets not from the asset store, go to where you put the model in your project folder, click on your model, and click on the Read, Write, Enable checkbox, and click Apply. I want to preface this entire section that the footage isn't in chronological order. You'll just have to listen and watch along to what I do and try to ignore any discrepancies in the video. In the Scenes folder, right-click the project window and create a new scene and name it what the map's name will be. Delete the main camera and directional light since those are needed for making maps. In your empty scene, make an empty game object called RF Must Haves. The name doesn't actually matter, but it's easier to keep track of stuff in there for later. Under RF Tools, Prefabs, Map Elements is where you'll find the essentials for making your map actually work. The water plane determines the sea level of your map. Anything underneath the water plane is water, so if your character falls out of bounds, they'll start swimming. If you don't want your map to have water, just place the Y level to be negative 800 or something really low. You can adjust the scale or disable the mesh render entirely to hide the water. It's still there, but you won't see it. The senior camera is the camera that displays when the map is first loaded. It's the camera angle you see in the loadout menu before you spawn in. I recommend placing it somewhere interesting. You can also animate the senior camera to show off multiple points of interest. I have a video on my channel demonstrating it. The minimap camera renders the minimap image that shows in the loadout menu. You can adjust the field of view to make it more zoomed in or zoomed out. Next is the reflection probe. When a material in UD is set to be very reflective, the reflection will use the reflection probe as the base for what image to reflect. Just place it in the middle of the map and forget about it. Time of day is mostly self-explanatory. All maps come with Rainfield's default ambient wind noise. You can delete it if you don't want ambient noise or replace it with different sound too. Sunlight is the main light source of your map. In the time of day object, you can adjust the night modes, lighting, fog, and skybox. You want specific objects to only appear on the night or day version of your map, placed inside day or night respectively. To add a terrain, right click your hierarchy and 3D object terrain. I make the center of my terrain close to the origin of the scene. 
origin is 0, 0, 0 from x, y, and z coordinates. When you make a new terrain, it will generate a terrain data file called New Terrain. You can click on the New Terrain object in the Terrain Collider to find where the file is located. I move the terrain to be next to the scene folder, then I rename the file with F2 and give the same name of the scene to keep my project organized. With your terrain selected, click on the paintbrush icon to begin sculpting. By default, Uni doesn't have many brushes, which is why I recommended adding the Terrain Sample Asset Pack. The Brush Size option adjusts how much terrain your brush covers. Opacity affects how strong the brush is. The Gear option lets you adjust the terrain's width and length and maximum height. By default, Uni's terrain will be 1000 meters squared. Avoid going over 2000 meters for both dimensions. Rainfield doesn't handle terrains larger than 2000 meters nicely. Since most of my map was made in Blender, the terrain I'm making is just for visuals and won't have much of an impact on gameplay. If you want advice on making good looking terrain, I'll be linking a YouTube playlist for making terrain with Unity. The best advice I can give is to look at real world examples. It is possible to rotate brushes by using Terrain Toolbox package, but that package is experimental and isn't guaranteed to be compatible with Riven Field. When you're ready to texture terrain, select the Paint Texture option, click on Edit Terrain Layers. You can create a terrain layer or add a pre-existing terrain layer. I've already got some from the asset I imported. The first layer will apply to the entire terrain. When you click on the terrain layer, you can edit its properties. Metallic and smoothness affect the surface's reflectiveness. I'd highly recommend increasing the tiling. Bigger tiles makes repetition less noticeable. You can just drag and drop assets from the project window into the scene window or the hierarchy window. If your model is missing its materials or textures, you can drag and drop the textures next to your models. Here, the vehicle models were made by Cinti Studios, so I had to import their textures. If your texture has transparent parts, enable the Alpha is Transparency checkbox and click Apply. Right-click in the project window and create a new material, name it. Then drag your texture into the Albedo slot. Change the rendering mode to Cut Out. Like with the terrain's texture settings, you can change the metallic and smoothness levels to make it more reflective or not. To replace the material, click on your model, then go to Mesh, Renderer, Materials, and replace the material with the new one you made. For every model you don't plan on animating or moving around in your map, you must mark it as static. Click on the Stag checkbox in the corner of the inspector window. Marking as static is important for optimizing your map. Now I use the search bar to find all the box coal models so I can assign them a box collider, then disable the mesh renderer. I repeat the process for mesh conv coal models and give them a convex mesh collider instead. Disabling the mesh render is important since the model is only needed for collision data and isn't needed for render. For every other model, I used my best judgment and tried to keep the mesh colliders to a minimum. Let's talk about the other objects in the map elements folder. The pathfinding related objects will be covered in the pathfinding section. Custom actor. This is a holder from the back when the skin mods are only possible by including custom skin with the map. I've heard it no longer works, so you can ignore it. Resupply crates. Heals and provides ammo to players and bots according to their range. Any model can have a resupply crate script, so you can use a different model if desired. Turret spawner. Spawns a turret when in the protect range of a flag. You can change the type of turret and the type to spawn. Vehicle spawner. Spawns vehicles when in the protect range of a flag. Respawn type determines what causes the vehicle to respawn. Spawn time is counted in seconds. You can change the type of vehicle and the type to spawn. If you've made your own vehicle mods, you can assign the prefabs here to make the vehicles pre-configured. Water volume. It's basically a pool of water. If you want multiple elevations of water, like the waterfall and rafts, you would want to use a water volume. Water volumes can be rotated as well. I use water volume in my raid remake because if I used water planes, and flung off the edge of the map would make the player and bots swim into the void. Inside the must-haves folder is where the pathfinding areas are stored. All maps must have an infantry and car pathfinding box. Drag and drop the box into your map and scale to be large enough to cover your map's playable area. The tile dust setting controls how precise the pathfinding is. Living it checked will make pathfinding less precise, but faster to generate and less likely to crash. Automatic cell size sets the cell size value according to the scale of the pathfinding box. You can disable it and use a specific cell size value to have more precise pathfinding. 
For the infantry settings, I set cell size to 0.1 and character radius to 0.4. Character radius is the width of the soldier model and determines if they can move between narrow gaps. Blockers are used to define more precise areas for pathfinding. These are best used for large maps that have some areas designated for close quarters combat. Still Raven has made a guide for using pathfinding blockers, which I'll link in the description. If there are areas you don't want bots to go, use an avoidance box and scale to fit the space. Avoidance boxes don't work for players, so you may be interested in creating invisible walls. It's as simple as using a scaled box collider with the ignore ray cast layer. If you don't have layers set up, you won't see these options. When bots go outside the playable area of the map, they'll stay there forever and won't despawn. You'll want to use a damage zone to kill them and make the bots respawn. The easiest way is to make a cube, remove the collider, scale it up, give it the damage zone component, then disable a mesh renderer. If your map has ladders, you can add them easily by making an empty game object as a child of your ladder model, then give it a ladder component. Look for the orientation of the top and bottom circle. They show you what direction the climbing animation will be. In my map, I had to rotate negative 90 degrees on the y-axis for the animation to be correct. If your map has boats, you need to use the boat pathfinding box, along with the infantry pathfinding box. The landing zone designates areas for bots to land their boats. The target should be set to the closest capture point. Speaking of capture points, you should import the cloth flag fix I posted on the Discord server and be using that instead of the capture point that comes with the modding tools. The original capture point prefab is missing icons for spawn points, and the cloth flag mesh doesn't render properly. Now onto the flag settings. The default owner sets which team owns the flag at the start of the match. You can set the blue, red, or neutral. Protect range is how far away bots will go to protect the flag. The range is also where vehicles and turrets will spawn. Short name is the name of the capture point when in-game. Capture range is how far away bots can be from the flag while still capturing it. Capture floor and ceiling determines the upper and lower limit of the capture area. Spawn point, which is the orange circle if you use my prefab, is where bots and players will spawn normally. You can duplicate the spawn point object to randomize spawn locations. Contested spawn points, the red circle, are where bots and players spawn when the flag is being captured by the enemy team. You should move the contested spawn point to be farther away from the flag, and not leave it at the default location. If the enemy team spawns and kills you while you're capturing, that's because the contested spawn point was too close to the flag. The neighbor manager in the must-haves folder determines the movement between capture points. The connections control of bots can go to the flags by land or by water. There's no air connection, because aircraft can just fly over anything in the way. The one-way checkbox makes bots only travel from flag A to flag B. If you're making an attackers versus defenders style map, you'll want to use one way neighbors. Once you have all your colliders configured, go to Ringfield Tools, Map, Scan Pathfinding. If you forgot any must have object for the map, Uni will post a warning message before you can scan pathfinding. Read and resolve the issue, then try again. It may take a while to scan depending on how precise your pathfinding settings are in relation to the scale of your map and your computer specs. When it's done, you can fly around the map and look at the bot's navigation. Blue arrows mean cover bots use while crouching. Green arrow means cover used while standing. The number above an arrow means field of view and likeliness of using that cover. You can use the arrow keys to switch between the different methods of transportation. If a pathfinding area is black, then it can't be reached by bots. If infantry pathfinding shows different colored areas, it means bots can spawn and travel along the area, but not to differently colored areas. You can fix the issue by making a connection, like a ladder or bridge, between the areas. If the issue is bots not entering an area, you can use pathfinding links. I recommend changing the icons of the pathfinding link so it's easier to find in Unity. Just place it between where you want bots to travel to and from, and they'll walk there as long as they're a collider underneath. You can even use pathfinding links to make them fall off the ledges. If you're having an issue with bots entering and leaving vehicles, it's because the bots can't reach the base of a flag with a vehicle, so the vehicle gets unused. Lighting plays a major role in strengthening your map's atmosphere. Aside from daylight settings, you should consider how the map's indirect lighting and shadows will look. Go to Window, Rendering, Lighting to access the Lighting tab. I'd recommend clicking on the new lighting settings to generate a file that saves your lighting preferences. When that's done, you can disable real-time global illumination and bait global illumination. The modding tools will give a warning message if you don't disable them, and I've had issues getting real-time and bait global illumination to work properly in EA26. In the environment tab, you can change your skybox, environmental lighting, 
and add fog. I use RPG White Lock's All Sky Asset Pack. I change the rotation of the skybox so that the sun included in the skybox roughly matches the rotation of the daylight in the time of day prefab. When using fog, make your fog's color match the horizon of your skybox. It blends faraway models into the sky and adds a feeling of scale by making objects seem further away. You can adjust how strong the fog is to your liking. After that, I recommend changing your environment lighting to use gradient. You should try out different colors to see how it reflects the atmosphere of your map. This map is in the desert and the sun is the primary light source, so I want everything to have a warm color palette. Lighting can make or break a map's visuals, so don't skip out on it. If your map has some objects that you want to emit light, such as these chem lights, you can add a light component to an empty game object. You can change what type of light is used from point, direction, to spotlight. Enable shadows if you want, but try to avoid having too many light sources on a map. It can become performance intensive. Lights can be given a lens flare if you want a cinematic look. Uni does not include any lens flares by default, but in a Discord server's map making channel, I upload a lens flare made by Lemu. You'll have to use the search bar to find it. In your light source, go to flare, then assign it. If you want your map to have a fire, dust storm, rain, or any other kind of visual effect, you'll want to mess around with Unity's particle system. The easiest way to get started with particle effects is to import Unity's particle pack and use one of their prefabs as a base. Alternatively, I and other Discord members have uploaded particle system assets to the Discord server for others to use. Import any of them, then you can tweak and adjust it to your liking. There's tons of tutorials on YouTube for specific effects in Unity's particle system, so search on the site to learn more. Audio is a great way to enhance the immersion of your map. If your map takes place in a forest, try adding some woodlands and ambient noise. Just add an audio source to your map, or replace a default ambient noise in the time of day prefab. Setting the audio to 2D plays it everywhere. 3D makes the sound play only around the area the audio source is placed. Uni can only handle 64 sounds playing at once, and the priority on a sound determines how likely it is to be replaced by another sound when Uni reaches the 64 sound limit. Setting priority to zero makes the sound always play, but if you want to be overtaken by another sound, then set the priority to a larger number. In cases where your map is set in an enclosed space, such as the tunnel, you should use a reverb zone. Reverb zones add reverb or an echo to your map, and you can change what it will sound like with different presets, or make a custom setting. If you play with Eagle Pancake's Battlefield 2042 HUD mod, You've probably noticed that some maps have a different senior camera. By default, Eagle's camera will give a top-down view of a map, but it's possible to make an override and choose a specific camera angle. Right-click your hierarchy and add a camera. Name it BF2042HUD underscore scenery camera, and disable the camera component. To make your camera angle most like Battlefield 2042's camera, rotate the camera slightly on the x-axis. You have to have all capture points available in the camera, or else you won't be able to spawn on that capture point. The last tip to optimize your map is using occlusion culling. Occlusion culling stops spreading objects not in the camera's view, helping tremendously with performance. Go to Window, Rendering, Occlusion Culling to access the tab. The reason we marked all non-moving objects as static was that occlusion culling would work properly. An alternative solution is to use an occlusion area that's big enough to cover your entire map. In the occlusion window, the Bake tab lets you adjust the settings. Smallest occluder determines the size of the smallest object that can hide other objects. Smallest hole is the smallest gap the camera can see through. I leave these on default and they work fine for me. Bake your occlusion with the button in the corner. In the Visualization tab, select the scene camera and move around to see the effect the occlusion culling has on your map. This step should be very obvious. Playtest your map. You want to keep a lookout for missing colliders or ways to get out of bounds of your map. For balance, you want to use your own judgment and try playing as Eagle, Raven, and Spectator to see how bots interact. Now will be a good time to take pictures of the map before uploading to the workshop. Before you can upload to the workshop, your Steam account cannot be a limited user. You have to spend at least $5 USD on Steam. You can read Steam's page on limited user accounts for more information. When you're all done with your map and ready to release, you should consider what your map's thumbnail and icon will look like. Workshop icon should be a square image and must be under 1 megabyte. If you use a rectangular image, 
black bars will appear on your icon. You can use a GIF for your workshop icon as well. When your map is uploaded to the workshop without a custom map thumbnail, then the game will use the Steam icon but squash to fit the game's resolution. If you decide to use the GIF, you'll need to make a map thumbnail or else your map will have a red question mark. Your thumbnail has to be 485 by 300 and be named the same name as your map with .rfl.png at the end. To begin uploading to the workshop, click on Rainfield Tools, Publish to Steam Workshop, Connect to Steam, then Create a New Item. This window is where you send the mod to workshop icon, give it a name, and select which mod to upload. You only have to click the RFL file to upload it. If you want to remove it, click on the file again. I type the descriptions in Steam rather than Unity. Since I'm using a GIF thumbnail, Unity will display a red question mark as the icon. Open File Explorer and go to where your Unity setup is. On the root folder is a workshop staging folder. In there, find the folder that matches the ID of your new item. Drag and drop your map thumbnail into that folder. You can make your mod release publicly, or change its public status through Steam. You'll be taken to its page on the Steam Workshop. You can now add images to show off your map. If you use Steam's inbuilt screenshot function, those images are saved as JPEGs and are low enough in file size that you can drag and drop all of them at one time. For your description, you should write the following. Lore, if you're a nerd. Recommend bot count and game modes. And lastly, what third-party assets you use. Some free assets require you to credit the original maker. If you don't, they do have the right to get your mod taken down. To update your mod, click on Publish to Steam Workshop again. Connect to Steam, then load the mod you want to update. Unity will detect that the workshop item has a newer RFL. Find the name of the file you want to update, then click on it as you did to upload. Then publish the workshop again. That's map making in a nutshell. If you want to learn more, you can read Steel Raven 7's official guide to making maps in UD, as well as my ring guide for tips on map design. And also recommend watching Ben Bauer's level design video series. Bauer is a Ubisoft content director and has worked on many first-person game levels over the years. You can learn so much from his videos like ideal cover placement to planning on how your map should flow from the moon both teams spawn. I don't know how true. Bye.